Oh, hello. I'm Christy Erickson, Deputy Executive Director at the History Museum. A welcome to my office for a new series of virtual programs we're doing called Tales from History. I get to tell you some interesting stories uh, from our region's past. And today we're going to get started with the Merchants National Bank robbery, which was the very last bank robbery done by John Dillinger and his gang. So before I tell you about Dillinger and his gang robbing the Merchants National Bank, let's talk about Dillinger just a little bit. He was born in Indianapolis in 1903 and joined the Navy after a little bit of a troubled youth. So he apparently didn't like that Navy lifestyle and deserted, married a young woman, and apparently they were drawn to the dazzling dream of bright lights and city living and moved to the big city of Indianapolis, where they lived for a little while, but uh, he had some trouble there too and got in with a local pool shark. So in a way, to make some fast cash, they decided to rob a grocery store and unfortunately got caught in his first robbery attempt. Now, Dillinger's accomplice uh, pled not guilty and got two years in jail. And on the advice of his father, John Dillinger pled guilty, confessed to the crime, and got a maximum of 34 years in jail. So after serving eight of them uh, for this attempted robbery, um, he was paroled and didn't take it very well, thought he was uh, unjustly kept in prison for too long, and then started his life of bank robberies and crime and robbed a bank almost immediately. So as we get to this Merchants National Bank robbery, I'm going to use the South Bend Tribune to help me tell the story a little bit. So with the help of the South Bend Tribune, uh, which we are fortunate to have here at the museum in these enormous bound copies, this one is from July 1934 and lovingly describes the bank robbery on two full pages. Uh, apparently on the page with the photos, they needed a little bit of filler because there's also just a random cartoon um, and some photos that don't really have to do with the Merchants National Bank. But what they do show over here is uh, the jail in Lima, Ohio. So after John Dillinger was paroled from jail, uh, after serving eight years for his attempted robbery of a grocery store. He uh, was a little bit jaded um, and turned to a life of crime, uh, which would become his hallmark as public enemy number one. So he robbed a bank and was immediately caught and put in jail in Lima, Ohio, at which point the police frisked him and uh, found these plans on him for a prison break. And he said, I don't know anything about those. Those aren't mine and the police uh, heard his story and apparently said, yeah, okay, that sounds legit. And what happened was four days later, all of his friends were broken out of jail at the Indiana State Prison. And then all of his friends came and broke him out of jail in Ohio. And um, they started a bank robbery spree that crossed uh, several states because they ended up in Tucson, Arizona with all of this money, all of these guns, uh, bulletproof vests that they had stolen from other police armories and the hotel they were staying in caught fire. And what happened was the firemen who came to fight that fire recognized Dillinger, called the police, and then he was arrested and taken back to Crown Point where he was put in jail in the Crown Point Jail. So the Crown Point Jail was supposed to be escape proof. Um, it was overseen by a female sheriff, who you can see right here, named Lillian Holly. Mrs. Hawley had taken over job, uh, the job as the sheriff after her husband was killed about a year before the former sheriff by, uh, and I quote, a crazed farmer. And Mrs. Hawley uh, wrote a letter to the news um, saying things like she would take no monkey shines from Dillinger um, and was going to uh, be very hard on him and, and not, um, not allow any funny business in her jail. But what ended up happening was uh, they did a whole photo shoot out front where she and the prosecutor um, ended up taking uh, photos with him where he looked, uh, as you can see in this picture, um, just happy to be there. He would tell anybody who crossed his path that he was gonna break out of this uh, inescapable jail. And, um, and that's exactly what he did. The story is he whittled a gun out of a washboard and used it to convince the guards that he had a real gun and they just let him out and he walked out of the prison, stole Mrs. Holly's car and used it to cross state lines uh, into 
um, the next state, at which point he committed a felony and then the FBI was now in his case. Unfortunately for uh, Sheriff Hawley, uh, when the most notorious criminal in the United States breaks out of an inescapable jail, people are going to look for somebody to blame, and they decided to blame her. Um, the picture was um, uh, shown as proof as she was, you know, hoodwinked by his masculine wiles and charmed by him and allowed him to leave and gave him her car. And um, after a thorough investigation, she was cleared of all incidents, but her reputation as a sheriff was uh, ruined pretty much after that. So, um, but she went on to be a, a pretty prominent public figure. Now, John Dillinger has now escaped from jail with all of his friends, with uh, two Thompson submachine guns that he stole from the Crown Point Jail, and with a really fast police patrol car. So he's now embarking on another bank robbery spree across um, Illinois and Indiana. And uh, we're leading up to um, June 30th, 1934, when he entered South Bend to rob the Merchants National Bank on Michigan Street. So if you're familiar with the corner of Michigan and Wayne Street, uh, which you can see in this photo here, the Merchants Bank uh, is not right on the corner. What's actually right on the corner um, is uh, Nisley Shoes, Nisley? The pronunciation guides don't come with papers. But um, what's there right now is Cambodian Thai. And then next to that is the former Dainy Maid Bake Shop. <clears throat> so if you're like me and get a TV bar with your pad tie, you're pretty familiar with that area. And then right next to that uh, was the Merchants National Bank. So um, at around 1130, the story is that a brown Hudson sedan was double parked on Wayne Street. And then another car uh, dropped some men off right in front of the bank. And Dillinger, uh, with his machine gun and two of his other men, entered the bank. Dillinger uh, shot some bullets into the ceiling in order to scare all the people in the banks while the tellers ran away. Uh, many of the other patrons went and hid in the back and his men started scooping money into bags um, and ended up with about $28,000 in the middle of a Saturday. Um, it was busy on Michigan Street. It was really hot that day. And as soon as the nearby patrol cop, uh, traffic cop in the corner, heard the gunfire in the bank, he ran over um, to try and help I guess, and was shot by one of the guards um, who were keeping watch outside the bank. So he was the uh, only person to be killed in this bank robbery, was this first cop at this, the very beginning. And that's kind of when things got pretty buck wild on Michigan Street. The police officer was shot. Um, people heard the commotion, started running toward the bank because um, Kids, don't run toward gunfire if you hear it in a city. Um, as you'll learn from all these other people who are about to get wounded, not a good idea. Uh, people were hanging out of the windows of the building around to see what was going on. And what happened was the two men um, on guard outside the bank started just spraying machine gun fire all over the street. And so at that point, most people started uh, retreating, hiding inside, um, going in other places. Uh, for some of them, such as Harry E. Berg, who owned a jewelry shop on Wayne Street, he got his own gun and came outside and, and tried to shoot them, but was no match for the Tommy gun and ended up going back inside and hiding. Um, he was up against uh, who was believed to be Babyface Nelson, who was part of uh, Dillinger's gang at the time. And uh, the gang also seemed to have bulletproof vests, so they were just far better armed than anybody else on the scene. Um, and across the street, some people were sitting in a parked car. Um, actually, two men who lived right on the lot that the museum is in now had carpooled um, to do some shopping, and both of them were um, wounded. One of them in the car was grazed on the side of his head and did the smart thing and drove his car around the block to get out of danger, um, whereas the other one uh, hid behind another parked car and, and also survived. Um, meanwhile, the second guard outside entered a nearby store, which, uh, which is the shoe store right here, got all of the patrons inside and lined them up out on the street to use as hostages and um, lined them up outside. At this point now, other officers are starting to show up, but um, 
getting through traffic downtown at such a busy time took them a little while to get there. And um, they're preparing to open fire on the gang, but there's still crowds of people around. And at this point, the robbers emerged from the bank, each holding uh, a person as a human shield in order to try and prevent uh, the police officers from firing on them. So um, the people who were held hostage by the Dillinger gang included P.G. Staley, who was the manager of the Birdsell Manufacturing Company, um, a man named Delos Cohen, who was a vice president of the bank, as well as Irvin Bouchard, who was a manager of a radio store nearby. And Mr. Bouchard swore up and down that the man who was holding him was not Dillinger. He said he had studied photos of Dillinger and he knew Dillinger and that wasn't Dillinger. Whereas everybody else who gave eyewitness testimony said, yep, that was definitely him. Um, Bouchard later said, well, there was a guy with dark glasses that I guess could have been Dillinger. So, uh, you know. Eyewitnesses sometimes uh, a little dubious. Now, Mr. Staley identified one of them as Dillinger and tried to reason with them um, and eventually broke away and ran across the street, hid behind a car. He was shot in the leg. So at this point, the Dillinger gang um, have reached their brown Hudson that is double parked on Wayne Street and get in the car and flee the city. I love how the media keeps referring to the car as their machine. Um, so their machine took off down the street. I think I'm going to start calling my car my machine. Um, do you want to get in my machine? Do you like my machine? No. Um, and they took a couple turns. Um, so there's some discrepancy of whether they fled south down 31 or down Washington Street. Uh, later on, it was determined that they actually had two cars. So that is... Um, why there's a little bit of argument there. And they also drop tax along the highway because apparently the Dillinger gang lives in a Looney Tunes cartoon uh, to stop people from following them down US 31. So, you know, everyone knows that uh, rogues are proficient in caltrips. So um, I guess it would make sense for a Dillinger gang to have some tax. So you can see here uh, in the paper, they've got uh, this picture of the scene with numbers. So number one um, is where Howard Wagner, the uh, traffic cop who was unfortunately killed at the scene, that's where he fell wounded, is number one. Number two is the Merchants National Bank building uh, with the clock in the front. Number three outside is where P.G. Staley was wounded by um, John Dillinger. Four and five were the two machine gunners who were standing on the street uh, at watch duty. Number six, was the sedan double parked on Wayne Street. Number seven is the Harry Berg jewelry store where that gentleman tried to come out of his jewelry store and, and fight the desperados. Uh, eight and nine on this are nowhere in any of these articles referenced. So not sure what those are supposed to mark, but um, not listed as part of this news. Uh, also on this page, you can see two photos of an automobile hit by bullets. Doesn't say which one or where. Um, two people who tried to fight the gang. You can also see a photo of the inside of the Merchants National Bank building, as well as a photo of the ceiling uh, with the bullet holes. And again, a cartoon that doesn't seem to have anything to do with anything. So on the other page are eyewitness stories. And there's a couple pretty good ones here, which I'm going to share with you. Now, among these eyewitness stories, they take great pains to make sure people understand that the Merchants National Bank is fully insured and that the money that was stolen um, is uh, not going to affect anybody's investments, and also that the Dillinger gang missed, uh, as they describe, several stacks of gold and silver in the bank. So um, not very observant while they were um, taking the money from the cash register tills. There's also an article um, that I enjoyed with the headline, Hold Up Thrill to Women But Scares Men, where a woman who was in the bank um, named Mrs. Edwin J. Buchner, Buchner? Again, no pronunciation guides here, talks about having to go hide in the director's office with several other people and one other woman, and that the other woman uh, described it as being thrilling, but the men uh, seemed pretty scared. So this whole article is all about how excited she was by this bank robbery. There's some note uh, that 
part of the reason that it took so long for the police to respond to the robbery was a lack of municipal funds, meaning that most of the police cars didn't have radios, so they weren't able to call the station, call for other cars to get back up there as well. So um, they were trying to cut some budget corners that year and, and weren't able to respond as fast as they might like to. Um, they talk a lot about how the bandits' cars were much faster than the police cars. Um, noted that, uh, unfortunately for my friends next door, most of the police cars were Studebakers and not able to keep up with the bandits' cars or the motorcycle. One of the cars, one of the police cars got two flat tires. The other one had a gas line that blew and the motorcycle apparently just gave up and was abandoned in Lakeville. Uh, so the Dillinger gang was able to get away. My favorite thing listed here is um, that they did an airplane search after uh, the gang got away and they got in a plane with several policemen who were quote, uh, heavily armed and flew this plane all around the country roads and wooded areas around the city and swooped down to investigate any suspicious cars. So let's think about this for a minute. You're out for a country drive with your friend, your family, uh, you know, maybe enjoying the scenery, and an airplane swoops down on you north by northwest style, full of armed police officers to make sure that you're not a gangster. I have to think that would be pretty memorable, and also who thought that would be a good idea? Um, Clearly, they didn't even find them, so I'm not sure if that is standard practice for gangsters at the time, but um, something that that apparently they decided to do, uh, as you know, as well as just employing uh, people like WSBT and the South Bend Tribune to help get descriptions of all of the bank robbers out, so people can help find them. What ended up happening was um, they did find the Brown Hudson um, in. Uh, near Logansport, about, uh, I want to say 40 to 50 miles west of Logansport, near the Illinois state line, um, abandoned. Four boys out there saw it pull up, and then another car pull up, and the men get out and get in the second car. It was full of bullet holes, um, including one in a straight line with the uh, driver's side, and it was confirmed later that one of Dillinger's men was wounded in the in the robbery, but not Dillinger himself. So by the time the investigators were able to get to that car, it had been so uh, handled um, by the people in the area who all came out to see this car that was used by, you know, public enemy number one, that any fingerprints or evidence in it was um, not really usable. But they found his car eventually, and then uh, that ended up being his last bank robbery. The Merchants National Bank robbery occurred on June 30th, 1934, and uh, Dillinger was famously shot by federal agents on July 22nd, 1934. So he laid low for a little while, but unfortunately uh, attended uh, a show at the Biograph Theater that fateful night and was um, pointed out by that woman in red. Uh, so one last thing before uh, I let you go. We uh, do have one thing in our collection relating to that Merchants National Bank robbery, and that is our Thompson submachine gun. Uh, now, this one in particular was actually at that bank robbery in the trunk of one of the police cars um, that uh, responded to the scene. This is actually uh, was once property of the St. Joseph County Police, and uh, you can see on the side where it says St. Joseph County. And many police uh, departments, um, other law enforcement, bought guns like this one in order to combat the firepower that um, gangsters like Dillinger had. So this one was our police department. Uh, according to the records that we have, it was never actually used and was donated to the museum in 1988. So if you're interested in, in this type of firearm, this is a model of 1921. These were um, developed for World War I, but is most notoriously used by gangsters. Um, they were also used in World War II. This one has a magazine that can hold uh, 50 45 caliber bullets and fires about 450 rounds a minute. So um, this is one of the 
Uh, we think the highlights of our collection says it's got a great story, and it is normally on display in our Voyages Gallery, where uh, I'm going to put it as soon as we're done here. Thank you for joining me today. Um, hope you uh, learned a little bit about uh, the happenings of June 30th, 1934 on Michigan Street. And next time we'll be talking about something that is a little bit less tragic.